Howdy folks, what's going on today? We're gonna to be making a really fun effect inside of Unreal where we're taking a texture that's coming from Touch Designer. And in this case, we have a generative ramp. It's going over spout into Unreal. And then a Niagara system is sampling the frame very quickly and emitting particles that have the color, alpha, and all of the characteristics of that frame of data coming over. And you can see here, it creates this really cool effect where you can almost imagine that you're seeing frames of the movie getting pulled out with particles. And there's a lot of really creative stuff you can do with this just based on whether you're changing the type of ramp. And we can see here, it creates these cool tunnels, or if you're just feeding in your own movie content. So with that said, let's dive through actually walking through this project and how it's all put together. So first and foremost, inside a touch designer, we just have a very simple ramp here, but this could be anything, a movie file in, it could be a video feed, and then we're feeding that to a siphon spout out top. And this is the texture sharing mechanism that I recommend to most people, especially if you're working just on one computer. Uh, it's fast, it's efficient, there's very little artifacts. So Spout is a great protocol to use. Now, if we hop over into Unreal now, if you've never set up a connection between Touch Designer and Unreal for texture video sharing, don't worry, it's really easy. All we need to do inside of our settings for the project in our plugins is make sure we have our off-world live live streaming camera plugin enabled. If you don't, you can go and grab this off the marketplace for free. It's a great plugin and it works right now with 4.25 and 4.26. So hopefully we're gonna see 4.27 support added soon. So once we have this, all we have to do is enable it inside of the project. And then what we'll see inside of our actors is the OWL spout receiver object. Now all you really have to do is take this object, click and drag it and drop it anywhere inside of your scene. Now I already have one inside of my environment here and setting it up is super easy. There's a couple of parameters that we have right here specifically for dealing with our spout setup. The first and most important is probably the receiver name. So in this case, I would go over to Touch Designer, grab the name of the sender that I have, and I would paste that inside my receiver name. Then I would turn on the active checkbox. And then the final thing we have to do is assign this to a render target. Now, if you never worked with render targets before, don't worry, in this case, it's super simple. All we have to do is right click in our content browser, go to materials and textures, and create a render target. And then you can go ahead and give that a name. So I'll call that test for this case. And then from this dropdown, you'll see that render target is available. And then all you have to do is click on it. Now I ha already have a render target here, so I'm not gonna update my render target. But the nice thing is you don't have to worry about any of the render targets settings or features. All you have to do is tell the OWL spout receiver object, hey, take that texture you're getting over spout and apply it to this render target. Now from there, we're, ready, we're already ready to dive into our Niagara system. Now I'm not gonna rebuild this Niagara system from scratch live, but I, what I will do is talk through every single module and parameter so you can recreate this at home very easily. So I started this from a purely empty template, so not even any of the starter materials inside of this Niagara system. And if we look at our kind of overall system settings and our system spawns and our system updates, we can see everything here is default. So you don't have to change anything in here. Now I'm going over to my actual Niagara emitter. Now, the first thing that I always recommend is unless you're working on a little bit of an older piece of hardware, or maybe you don't have a GPU as you're kind of learning, after that stage, you almost always want to be using a GPU compute sim because that's gonna let you emit more particles, have better graphics and better performance all at the same time. So first I went ahead and changed this to a GPU compute sim. And then I enabled fixed bounds because once we get into the GPU compute land, we have to set some boundaries for that simulation. And you can see here, I set this to minus 500, minus 500, minus 500 in one corner of the box and 500, 500, 500 all the way in the other corner of that fixed boundary box. Now from here, that's about all we really have to change on our emitter properties. So we can go down to our emitter update area and we've got two modules here. First is emitter state. And this is kind of where we control how quickly this system is emitting particles. 
So for example, you see the little bit of space in between each kind of frame of particles that correlates to this loop duration here. So we have this set to 0.05. Now the lower you set this, the more particles you're going to have. So be careful because you could crash your system if you set this number too low. But just to visualize this, what we could do is say maybe make this 0.5. And now you're going to see more space in between those frames of particles being emitted. And if we went the other direction and maybe went down to 0.025, you can see now we have even more than before. Now I find 0.05 is a nice balance between we've got a lot of particles, we can see the frames, which is really interesting, and it doesn't overwhelm my system with too many particles. So aside from just updating this loop duration, there's really nothing we have to worry about in our emitter state, except just making sure that the life cycle mode is set to self, because by default, this is gonna be set to system. And in this case, we wanna edit this emitters properties individually. From here, the next thing we wanna do is spawn the particles in a grid. Now this is where a lot of the magic of this very simple patch really starts to pick up. So instead of just emitting particles on a specific position or emitting particles from a mesh, essentially what we wanna tell the Niagara system to do is first create a grid. And the nice thing about this is we can set the number of rows and columns with the X and the Z count. Now, if you're coming over from Touch Designer, remember in Unreal, Z is up, not depth. So in this case, X, and Z are what we're gonna be controlling to add or reduce the density of our grid. But one of the best features about using this spawn particles in grid module is that it's gonna give us some UV positional data of where the particle is on that grid. And that's what we're gonna be using very shortly to actually sample our spout texture. So in this case, our spawn particles in a grid, all I really changed here was updating this X count and this Z count. Now I find even with just about 80 uh, columns and 60 rows, that's quite enough density to still kind of make out a lot of the details of the texture. But of course you could turn these up or down also based on the performance of the system. Because remember, every time it emits a frame, it's going to emit 80 times 60 particles right now. So for on my system, that's okay. But for your system, you may want to make that less or greater. Now, when you make that spawn particles in a grid, usually what it's gonna do is tell you, hey, you also need a grid location because without that, the spawn particles in a grid doesn't really work. So when you hit fix issue, it's automatically gonna create this grid location. And the nice thing here is we really don't have to worry about any of its actual functionality. And that's the nice thing about working with Niagara. A lot of the time it tries to help you when you're doing something, if you also need a complementary node or a dependency module, it'll automatically help you make those things. Now there is one feature on this grid location that is actually interesting to play with, and that is the padding per cell in the dimensions area down here. And what this does is this adds space in between each one of the points on that grid. So for example, right now I have this set to one. So you can see it's actually a pretty dense grid of particles. But what I could do is maybe set this to something like five, five, and five. And all of a sudden, we can see that it's a lot more spaced out. So if you were gonna work with some instance geometry, or if you wanted to have your particles be bigger, you could also increase the space between each one of those points on the grid. Now I find for this example, it gets a little bit too spaced out. So I like to keep this around one, one, and one. This gives me a nice density while I can still essentially tell the detail of what's going on. So from here, we go into a sample texture module, and this is where a lot of the magic happens. So if you've never seen a lot of parameters like this, don't worry, we'll get there in a second, but just talking through what's happening here. This sample texture, and the grid location all happened before the initialized particle module in this case, because what we want to do is essentially build up the data that we're going to feed to the particles that we're emitting. So in this case, we are getting the location on the grid and a color from our texture before we initialize our particle and say, hey, you should start here and your color is going to be this. Now the sample texture is really nice because 
it immediately wants you to select a render target, which luckily we created with our spout portion of this kind of setup. And it's really easy to find that render target in your project here. Once you assign that, the next tricky thing is sorting out the UVs. Now I'm gonna make a brand new sample texture here just so I can show you how these parameters get set in the first place because that's the tricky part for a lot of folks. Because you can see on a default sample texture module, we actually just have value fields for our X and Y. Now that could be all right if you just wanted to set a specific area, you know, a specific pixel that you want to texture. But in this case, we actually need to dynamically take the UV data from every single particle so that we can sample different parts of the image. So that's why you're gonna start seeing a lot of things like this, because what these types of parameters do, and we can actually go here and set this ourselves, is instead of telling the Niagara system that we want a constant value, we can say, hey, you know what? Actually, we're going to make vector 2D, which is a vector two, so two parts here, dynamically as we're going along. Now, once we tell it that we're gonna make a new vector T, uh, vector 2D dynamically, now we have our X and Y separated here. And now we're gonna go even further and say, okay, well, for every X position, what kind of data am I gonna put in it? Now, this is where a little bit of understanding about UVs really comes handy. But if you've never worked with UVs before, don't worry, they're basically like X and Y positions, but in a texture space. So you can almost think of them in this case as just regular old X and Y positions. Now, one tricky thing is that we're gonna see the output here from our grid location module. So after we've spawned all the particles in the grid and grabbed their locations, what's gonna happen is we're still gonna have a vector. So we still don't have an individual value that we can throw inside of this X position or in this Y position. And that's why we not only have to make a new vector 2D, we also have to make a float from another vector here. So when we get to our X position, Again, we want to make a float from a vector, and then it's gonna separate the X, Y, and Z. And in this case, what we can do is say, well, don't worry, I'm not gonna enter this data manually. What I want you to do is go to the grid locations output and grab each particle's position. So an easy way to do this is to type output, and what you'll see is the output of all the different modules in this Niagara system that have some kind of interesting data. And in this case, it's already just pre-selecting all of the vector data for us. So in this case, what we want is the output from the grid location node, and we want the grid UVW position. So we want the position on the grid of that specific particle. Now, once you do that, all we have to do is assign which channel we want to take out of that UVW vector, because there's three parts in that UVW, and we're gonna take one of them and then assign it as a float to that U position. And then you could also rinse and repeat the same thing here. So we know for our Y, we also have to make a float from a vector. And that vector is going to be the output of the grid location. And we want the grid UVW point. Now remember again here, this is one of those areas where if you're just getting into Unreal, you might get stumped a little bit because Z is up in this application, not the depth like it is in Touch Designer. But essentially, once you wrap your head around this little bit of kind of manipulation of the parameters and getting that data from the grid location, this sample texture is really powerful because in one node, what it does is it takes the position of our particle off the grid, uses that to scan across the incoming spout texture, gets the color of it, and then when we go into our initialized particle module here, we can directly set the color mode of each one to be the output of the sample texture module that we just created. So if, for example, you've never seen this before, you know, we reset this one, and let's imagine we had just made it, it's unset, we're gonna go to direct set, and very similarly, similarly <laughs> to the sample texture, instead of setting a static value here, we want to grab the output of that sample texture. So I can click the drop down, type output, and automatically it's gonna do a really good job of saying, hey, well, the only other output that could really be applicable here is the output of your sample texture module, which is gonna give us a linear color value. Aside from that, in the initialized particle and actually in the rest of this system, everything is really simple. 
So here I have my lifetime just set to a random value between one and three. I turned off the position mode and set it to unset because we already have our positions coming from our spawn particles in a grid module. I added a little bit of a randomness to the sprite size just to give it a little bit more textural feel because if everything is perfectly uniform, it starts to look a little bit boring. And then we can go down here and you can see we only have a few elements inside of our particle update. Our particle state just makes sure that the particles are killed when their lifetime is finished. Our linear force is pulling the particles 150 units of force towards the camera here on the Y axis. And then we have a solve forces and velocity node, which is automatically going to get added for us once we start applying forces inside of our particle update. So that's all there really is to it. And it unlocks so much creativity here because what we can see is we have this fun particle system and the way it behaves, especially with alpha, and you can see how alpha creates these holes inside the architecture, really allow you to do a lot of fun and creative things. So hopefully this walkthrough of how to set up this kind of network and work with spout textures coming across into Unreal and how to sample those in a Niagara system is helpful for you. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.